So now it is my pleasure to invite our spiritual leader, this week's birthday boy, <laughs> to the podium to share with us this morning the encouragement from which I'm sure we will all get an assignment, but all these things are only for our good. So let us invite Reverend John to come and deliver. Thank you. Good morning, family. And a special good morning to all of you who are in Kingston, because a lot of people, I think, are having their uh, Heroes Weekend out of town, and also a special welcome to those who join us by watching and listening on the World Wide Web, and a special welcome to those who come from foreign with regularity and make it to church when they're here, the Samuels, and we have Aunt Lily's little baby sister, called, lovingly called Sister Vin, and she's followed by a handsome young man um, when she comes to church. I think they're here for a birthday this month, and I hope you're going to be here for... It's for Hero's Day, okay. And also, I hope you'll be here, both sets of, um, of people, for Mr. Dexter's concert on Sunday. Oh, very good. Lilith is not a member of the male chorale. Just... just. <laughs> oh, Lilith gets her award. Miss Dr. Lilith Nelson receives her national award tomorrow. Please stand so we can her. Wow. I am sure Sister Vin brought the frock. You know, I love that uh, reading from the... the, 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 the inspirational reading this morning when Goldsmith talks about being lifted up in consciousness. Because I, I often wonder, can you lift other people up in consciousness? But the master teacher Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And traditional religion has taken that to be a reference that he was making to his crucifixion, being lifted up off the ground. But we know, as we study metaphysics, that being lifted up refers to being lifted up in consciousness. Which reminds me of a time when I was lifted up physically in, a, in another kind of way. When I was a young and gay, footloose, and fancy-free bachelor back when, I bought myself a motor car which was a French in make. It was a Citroen uh, GS Palace, and it was the, the automobile of the, the century at the time, and all the magazines said it, it lauded its technological perfection. It had a very interesting feature. Whenever you started it, a pneumatic um, system made it rise up off the ground. And so all the little boys at, on the street would say, make it rise up again, son, shake it, Matty. It's, it's behind. <laughs> um, for those who are abroad, that means it's rear end. So this Citroen JS Palace really was my pride and joy until I discovered that there were only two people who could fix it. Um, the two mechanics that had been sent to France by the, the, the distributors. And once it was giving me trouble, and one uh, mechanic was gone for a refresher course in Paris, and the other one was at home with the flu. So I was at a party at 3 o'clock one morning. Thank God it wasn't too far from where I was living, and the car's gears just wouldn't work. The only way it would go was in reverse. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, I reversed all the way home. <laughs> I've titled my talk this morning, Reverse, the best way forward. Of course, I'm not talking, my friends, about reversing a vehicle for any distance on a main road. This is not a good idea. I'm talking about developing the kind of consciousness which reverses our fortunes. The challenges we face can fill us with such dread that they may seem insurmountable, and we might feel as though we are racing full speed ahead towards certain disaster and calamity. But the science of mind teaches us that we always have the power of choice. Everybody here gets that, right? We can choose. Because we are created in the image and likeness of God, we really do have the ability to determine what we want to experience. 
But to do this, we must be willing to change our thinking and this sometimes necessitates a complete reversal of the ideas we have been systematically cultivating. If you listen to any of the many talk shows on Jamaican radio, you will hear people calling for change, but it's, it is soon apparent that the call is for everyone else to change. Their spouse, their children, the school system, the government, you name it. What are the churches doing about it? What is everybody else except me doing about it? We must come to the recognition, my friends, that each of us is responsible for our lives. And if meaningful positive change is to be made, it must begin with each one of us. Tomorrow, October 17, is being celebrated in Jamaica as National Heroes Day. The brave men and women who paved the way for us and laid the foundation of our, our nation did not accomplish what they did by calling for someone else to stand up to oppression and injustice. In the face of apparently overwhelming odds, they shouldered the responsibility of creating the change that they wished to see. So we need to stop saying, what is everybody else doing about it? And to ask ourselves that very simple question, what am I going to do about it? If I want a more peaceful Jamaica, what am I going to do about my squabbling with my neighbor, my co-workers, the unkind things I unthinkingly say about people without a second thought? If I want a, a world that works for everyone, how am I going to make this happen by changing the way I think, I speak, and I act, and how I relate to other people? So the secret to overcoming great odds is to reverse what I call your self-talk. Anybody here talk to themselves? A lot. A great deal of our self-talk is learned from the negative ideas of others, in particular in our formative years. Many people think of themselves as being less than worthy, less than enough. Because this idea was planted in their subconscious by caregivers who may or may not have meant them well in their formative years. These thought patterns and ways of habitual thinking formed in early childhood can persist throughout our adult years and keep us from getting ahead if we don't reverse the way we think. Many of us were scolded or shamed, and we didn't conform to our parents' standards, if we didn't conform to their standards, and this has resulted in low esteem, low self-esteem for many. Our self-talk may contain phrases such as, I really am not good enough, or I don't deserve to have that. And as we know, our resulting experience will reflect these false ideas. It takes a reversal of our self-talk to overcome the limitations others may have put on us. For example, when we think of the biblical David, we don't immediately think of the limitations he had to overcome. Our minds go directly to the story of how he slew Goliath. We think of him as a great warrior and king, yet David knew the pain of having a parent who did not believe in his potential. As the story goes in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the prophet Samuel arrived at David's house to anoint one of his sons to be Israel's next king, Jesse, David's father, didn't even bother to call him in from the fields. Jesse put forward the sons he thought looked kingly, looked regal and, and noble in stature. Samuel was also looking for someone with kingly demeanor. And according to the story, Samuel looked at Eliab, Jesse's eldest son, and said, and I quote, surely the Lord's anointed is before him, unquote. But the Lord said to Samuel, and I quote, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Unquote. As the story goes, Jesse presented seven sons to Samuel, but God didn't choose any of them. God wanted David, the one with heart. 
So friends, if you are one of those who feel that you were just never good enough in the eyes of your parents, remember that God values you for who you truly are, his beloved creation whom he declared to be good and very good. Which brings me to your assignment. As Carol predicted, there would be an assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is designed to help you improve the image you have of yourself. It is an exercise this week in positive self-talk. And here's what I want you to do. Before today is out, I want you to make a do well list. A do well list. Write down at least 20 things you do well. They don't have to be extraordinary things to be important. Your do, do well list might include such things as I'm an excellent organizer, I'm a good listener, I'm a reliable partner, I'm an imaginative lover, I'm a generous friend. Just list the things that you do well as a human being. Also, give yourselves a pat on the back for your accomplishments so far in your life. Lilith, you have a big pat to give yourself. And we are patting you as well. And for any challenges that you may have overcome. Above all, be mindful this week of your self-talk. And if you catch yourself putting yourself down, just take out your do well list and read it out aloud. And then affirm. The truth of my being is, I am spirit in expression. Can we say that? The truth of my being is, I am spirit in expression. I am worthy of my good. Together? I am worthy of my good. So put it together and you have, the truth of my being is, I am spirit in expression, and I am worthy of my good. Let's try that. The truth of my being is, I am spirit in expression, and I am worthy of my good. Then stand still, my friends, and watch the universe produce your good in unexpected and interesting ways. Another important use you can make of reverse in order to move forward is by turning your perspective around. This is what it really means to repent. It calls for you to look at the positive possibilities rather than dwelling on the negative, uh, the negative ones that are shrouded in fear and doubt. The way the law of attraction works is simple. What you believe and constantly think about attracts circumstances and situations which are compatible with what you are focused upon. This is what Job meant when he declared in Job chapter 3, verse 25, quote, for that which I greatly feared is come upon me, unquote. And yet many of us tend to picture the possibilities of situations becoming worse instead of anticipating a positive outcome. So if someone is diagnosed with a disease, for example, from which 95% of people die, the inclination is to forget that one could very well be in the 5% who triumph over it. And let's do the math. If 10,000 people contract this disease each year, the 5% expected to survive would be 500, which is a fair size number. If we reverse our perspective and begin to impress our subconscious mind with the fact that we intend to be one of the 500, we put a new cause in motion which will help to bring about the desired healing. Remember that the master teacher, Jesus, knew what he was talking about when he assured us, and I quote, it is done unto you as you believe, unquote. And we, he knew that the divine intelligence which permeates all creation responds to our, our firmly held beliefs. The universal principle was not only taught by Jesus, it's taught in all the major religions of the world. Did you know that? Every single religion talks about this principle. In fact, since the beginning of time, this all-important principle has been taught by the world's greatest teachers, philosophers, prophets, and leaders. Great leaders have disagreed on many points, but upon this principle, they are all in complete agreement. We become what we believe. It is done unto you as you believe. Marcus Aurelius, a great Roman emperor said, and I quote, a man's life is what his thoughts make it, unquote. 
And Ralph Waldo Emerson said, and I quote, a man is what he thinks about all day long, unquote. The Bible is perfectly clear. All things are possible to him that believes. Mark 9, verse 23. To believe something, my friends, is to embody it and accept it as being valid, valuable, and true. To believe something is to embody it and accept it as being valid, valuable, and true for you. Larry Gallimore of the Broadway Christian Church tells a story that illustrates just how powerful our thoughts are. As he tells it, in Russia a few years ago, a railway worker accidentally locked himself in a refrigerator car. Unable to escape or attract attention, he resigned himself to his fate. As he felt his body becoming numb, he took a pencil out of his pocket and recorded the story of his approaching death. He scribbled on the walls of the car, I am becoming colder. Still colder. I am slowly freezing. Half asleep now. Oh my God. These may be my last words. When the car was opened, the man was found dead. But listen to this. The temperature of the car was about 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Officials found that the freezing mechanism was out of order and that there was plenty of fresh air available. Although there was no physical reason that they could find, the man had died. It was concluded that he had died because he believed he would die. Powerful story. The concept then of focusing on the positive possibilities is applicable in every area of your life, including the all-important area of finances. A friend of mine, affectionately known as John the Beloved, somehow got in the habit of looking anxiously at his diminishing checking, checkbook balance and impressing his mind with the idea that he didn't have enough to make it past the third week of every month. Result? I never have enough to make it through to the end of the month. When I realized what I was doing, I began looking at my balance and giving thanks for what I have. Then I declared that I expected to multiply. I went further one week, and instead of tithing from a generous check I received for counseling, I endorsed the entire check to the source of my spiritual sustenance. The result? The funds I budgeted lasted me through to the end of the month. Friends, it really is done unto you as you believe. And how do you create your belief? You create it with your self-talk. My favorite story about the power of reversing direction in order to move forward to great goal accomplishment comes from the story in Luke 5, verses 4 to 11, about the beautiful Jesus fishing with five of his disciples on the Sea of Tiberias. The disciples had fished all night and had come up empty-handed, so they decided to pack it in. But Jesus instructed them to put back out to sea and to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. I can just imagine the reaction of these seasoned fishermen. Here is a carpenter telling them how to fish. Yeah, master, whatever. But when they reluctantly followed his advice, they caught so many fish that they were not able to draw in the net. The moral of this story, if you have been trying at something unsuccessfully, try casting your net on the other side. In other words, turn your perspective around. I remember once when I lived alone trying to install a new lock on my back door. I tried for what seemed like ages and just couldn't get the darn thing lined up on both sides of the door. The instructions didn't help either. My theory was that instructions for stuff made in China are first translated into Russian and then into English by a Japanese. 
But let me take responsibility and admit that it's my own impatience and stupidness. Anyway, I packed it all in, placed a chair behind the door, affirmed God is the only presence and power in this home, and went to my bed with the decision that I would call a locksmith first thing the next day. Well, on awakening, it was as though I heard this voice saying, turn it upside down. I looked around my bedroom and mumbled, turn what upside down? <laughs> the lock monkey, the lock. Now, only my mom called me monkey. So I was sure I was dreaming. And since she didn't know squat about installing locks while she was on this plane of action, I ignored the advice and dialed the locksmith. Would you know his number was busy? So I thought, let me just follow this crazy instruction before calling the professional again. Well, friends, I turned the lock upside down, and lo and behold, everything lined up perfectly, and the screws all fit. I think perhaps I may have been one of those fishermen who sat in disbelief at the feet of the beautiful Jesus. Turning your perspective around can also be beneficial to your health. A few years ago, a client complained to me that her retired husband wanted her to stay home with him almost constantly. The problem was she enjoyed a busy social life developed over the years when he was an executive and she was a housewife. She had become increasingly resentful of his demands on her time and had developed pains in one shoulder which were diagnosed as bursitis, or as my mom used to say, persitis. <laughs> Behold, beware all of you ladies who are carrying bigger and bigger and bigger satchels and banker baskets. <laughs> but she had actually come to me for two separate treatments, one for health and the other for tolerance and patience with her husband. She was really surprised because I was just reading Louise Hayes' um, You Can Heal Your Life, her book that talks about the metaphysical uh, cause behind physical and mental ailments. And I read to her that bursitis, according to the, the metaphysicians, um, had a, a root cause of repressed anger. And she said, I'm not angry. You know, when you're talking to a loved one and you say, what's the matter, honey? Matter? Anything the matter? Should anything be the matter? You know, yeah. She was vexed. After a very short while, I, I gave her an affirmation, and it is this. Love relaxes and releases all unlike itself. Love relaxes and releases all unlike itself. If you have any hurt in you this morning or tend to want to have a little twinge, let us say it together. Love relaxes and releases all unlike itself. And in a short order, the condition began to subside. And after a short while, she reported to me that her husband seemed to be appreciating how she felt and had even encouraged her to go out and hang with her girlfriend. Her pain disappeared and she reported that their sharing of their daily experiences was enriching and enhancing their relationship. Finally, the other area in which you need to find reverse gear fast if you hope to move forward is to replace fear with faith and love. In the epic poem, The Voice Celestial, written by Science of Mind founder Ernest Holmes and his brother Fenwick, the wayfarer, it's a person in the poem who is seeking the truth, and the presence, which is a, a voice from the presence and power, um, have this discussion. The wayfarer asks, what can I do to grow more faith and find some way to soothe my anguishment of mind? And the presence answers, no better way can be than that you share what faith you have with those who need such care and have still less of hope and faith. Though dim your torch, it still may light the lamp of him who has a greater need, and from your faint belief, his soul may flare into a saint. The grace with which you act, the love displayed, will raise men's faith in love, and by such aid they will be healed. So seeing others healed, your grain of faith becomes a harvest field. And you shall reap what you yourself have sown, 
a greater faith, which then becomes your own. End of that verse from Holmes and Fenwick Holmes. So sharing your faith, my friends, no matter how dim your reverse lights may be, will strengthen it and even light the way for others around you. If you are lifted up in consciousness, you will draw all men and women and children and life kind unto you. And so reversing your habitual patterns of negative thinking may not always be easy, and like most things that are worthwhile, it will take practice, my friends. But when you find yourself stuck in depression, discomfort, or fear, remember that you can experience life at a higher level of consciousness by reversing your self-talk, turning your perspective around, and reversing from fear to faith. It's the best way forward. Namaste.